Okay, so tonight or tomorrow I'll email you a link for the midterm solution so that you can check how well you've done before the tutors finish the marking. Okay, so um, today we move to arguably the most important technique that we will learn in this course uh, that probably uh, solves uh, uh, the largest number of more difficult problems and it's really ubiquitous in all fields uh, of uh, engineering, not just computer science, but for example, in telecommunications, uh, uh, dynamic programming is uh, used in uh, uh, decoding Viterbi codes. Uh, um, so, um, and students find it uh, uh, the most difficult uh, to kind of master and to understand properly, so we will spend uh, a bit of time going through a lot of examples because you don't have tutorials uh, we will replace them by uh, doing uh, lots of uh, problems in class uh, today and also uh, next week so what is the main idea of dynamic uh, programming it's sort of a one would call it a jigsaw method what is a jigsaw you have this uh, little pieces that you have to fit together to build the whole picture. And that's exactly how dynamic programming proceeds. Uh, you solve your problem by reducing it to solving smaller size problems, a little bit of divide and conquer uh, flavor. Uh, it's a, a, a kind of building the solution that you uh, need uh, from solutions to carefully chosen sub-problems. And the main difficulty in mastering uh, dynamic programming is to kind of figure out what should the sub-problems be uh, to allow uh, recursion because uh, more complex uh, solution to more complex problems is recursively built from the solution to uh, smaller size problems, okay? So, um, so the subproblems are chosen to allow easy recursion, as you will see, and the efficiency of DP comes from the following fact that these subproblems kind of overlap significantly. Uh, one subproblem may, may be used in building up solution for several other uh, more complex uh, sub-problems, but you compute the solution for the, each sub-problem only once, and you store it in a table, so that whenever you need uh, that uh, uh, solution to that sub-problem, you don't have to repeat uh, the work to solve it, you simply look up the solution in the table. So, uh, let us see a typical example where greedy fails, uh, but dynamic programming uh, uh, works beautifully. This is exactly the same setup uh, as you had in this uh, scheduling problem. You remember uh, we had a timeline and we had a bunch of activities with starting and finishing times. And we wanted to pick a subset of non-conflicting, non-overlapping activities that, are, that is largest in number. So as many activities, disjoint activities, uh, uh, as you can. So, and you remember we saw this by Greedy, always taking uh, the activity that ends the earliest, uh, right? But if you your task is not to maximize the number of disjoint activities, but to maximize the total duration of all activities chosen. So assume that you are uh, renting this uh, classroom per hour, right? Or per minute, whatever. And you have a whole bunch of activities. Well, because you charge per minute, you want to choose uh, uh, 
certain number of activities so that their total duration is as large as possible and they are all non-conflicting, meaning one ends before the next one starts. So um, that's a kind of typical example when uh, greedy, which is kind of local optimization, does not work because the activities can interact uh, all across kind of the spectrum so that uh, the, uh, along the timeline, so doing it locally, optimizing locally just uh, doesn't do the trick. So how do we solve this problem? First of all, we sort the activities according to their finishing time. So let's look at the picture and then we will go back here. Um, here is a typical example. So the green and red uh, and blue lines are your activities and we sort them in such a way that activity if j is smaller than i, then activity fj finishes before the activity fi finishes. Okay? So we sort all the activities um, in increasing order of their finishing time. So no, what does it mean that activities are non-conflicting? Well, activity fj, sorry, activity j, conflicts with uh, activity i because fj finishes only after the i activity started because fj is on this picture larger than uh, si, right? So um, on the other hand, all other activities that are in green are non-conflicting with the i activity, but of course they are uh, conflicting with uh, each other. And so we want to find the largest collection in the sense of the, its total duration time, and not the number of them, but uh, the total duration time. So here, are, uh, here is how we proceed. So first we sort the activities uh, in increasing order of finishing time, and then for we solve, rather than solving just the problem at hand, we make our life more difficult in a hope that this will make our life actually easier, as conflicting as this sounds. So you kind of uh, commit yourself to solving more problems than, including those that you are not asked to solve, but in such a way that they will produce an efficient solution to, to the problem that you want. And this is how you, uh, so the following are the sub-problems. So for every i, so you have a sequence of activities a1, a2, ai, all the way up to an. You solve the following problem. For every initial segment of the activities, so activity a1, a2, up to certain ai, where i is smaller than n, so for every initial segment, you find, you solve the following uh, problem. You find a subset of these activities that consists of non-overlapping activities and that it ends exactly with the activity AI. Uh, now this kind of might sound strange, but the point to add this constraint is to allow easy recursion. And we will show that uh, this, adding this constraint is, is non-restrictive. So we are looking for subset of SI, we call it sigma i. All activities are non-overlapping. Uh, the last activity is AI, so AI is included in your solution. And among all uh, uh, subsets, uh, sigma i, uh, that satisfy the condition one and two, you want to pick one that is of maximal duration, right? So you see, we are now, rather than, so you have, just imagine you have a bunch of uh, uh, activities. Let me find the chalk. I hope you can. OK, 
Can you see this line? Good. OK, so you have a whole bunch of partially overlapping activities, right? And this is activity i, and it finishes at some instant fi, starts at some instant si, right? Um, and then you have other activities here. So your ultimate goal is from all of these activities, pick a subset of activities that do not overlap so that their total duration is as large as possible, maximal. Rather than tackling this problem immediately, you solve and many problems, actually. <coughs> Namely, for every i that is smaller than n, you solve the following subproblem. One would be tempted to solve just the following problem. Among all activities that are on the left that finish before activity fi finishes, find a subset of disjoint activities that have maximal duration, maximal total duration. This would be just the original problem if you threw away all the activities uh, past activity i, right? But to make recursion simple, and this is one of the key tricks in dynamic programming, uh, we choose to add an extra condition. So we are not just looking for a disjoint set of activities that is of maximal duration, but we constrain it also that it must end with activity i. Okay? Now, once we solve that problem, we put it in a table, right? So that we can, whenever we need it, that we can just look it up. Okay, so let us see now. So let's denote by T of i the total duration of the optimal solution sigma i. So the total duration of uh, this joint set of activities that end with i and that is as, lo as long as uh, in length as possible. So how do we start the recursion? Well, the base case is uh, you start with activity one. Well, what is the maximal set uh, of, ma uh, of maximal duration of non-conflicting activities uh, that involves only first activity? Well, that's just the first activity. So when uh, i is equal to one, then we know that this optimal total duration is just simply t of, one, t of 1 equals fi, the finishing moment, minus the starting moment, because that's the length of this activity. Okay, now what you do, you assume that you solved your problem for all j's that are smaller than i. So now you are in the middle of uh, uh, this sequence, and you want to solve the problem to find what's the maximal duration uh, t sub i of disjoint activities uh, that end with activity i. And the solution is very simple. You simply look at all activities uh, that finish before this i activity starts. Essentially, you look at all preceding activities that are non-conflicting with i. So, for example, the red activity is out of uh, uh, picture because it conflicts. Now, among all the green activities, uh, you have already solved uh, right, because they are preceding the i activity, you have already solved the problem. And you can simply search and find the optimal solution for all of the green activities. Pick one of the longest duration and simply add the duration of the i activity. Right? So notice the reason why we insist that activity has to end with the activity i is simply because we know what 
sub-problems are relevant uh, for the optimal solution. Namely, we know that we simply have to remove uh, all the activities uh, simply from consideration, right? All the activities uh, that conflict with IT activity because by assumption we take IT activity. And then among all the non-conflicting activities, you pick one which has optimal solution. It has the largest, you see here, we pick uh, the activity um, J so that uh, this value, you see here, this value of course doesn't depend on J so you can ignore it. You simply find max Tj, maybe I should have written it in that form, max Tj, among all J's that are non-conflicting, you pick the largest one and you simply add the duration of the height activity. So the assumption that uh, we have to end with the height activity greatly simplifies the recursion because we know what we shouldn't consider. We shouldn't consider all the activities that conflict with the height activity and among the remainder, namely all the non-conflicting activity, you find one with the best optimal solution. And you simply extend it with the i activity to get optimal solution for i. Yes? Sorry? Okay, so we will, okay, so the, the, at the moment, we are not going to optimize because dynamic programming is already uh, really tricky. Uh, obviously, this, as I stated it, it will run quadratically because you simply have to, back to go backwards and look for all activities uh, that, do not, that end before the activity I starts and look up for all these values uh, in the table, right? So we have uh, the table is of size n because we solve all these uh, problems. And for every i, we simply scan all the activities, uh, right? And look for those that the finishing time, fk, no, uh, remember they are all um, sorted in increasing order. You simply look for all k's uh, so that fk is smaller than si you check what is the optimal solution and you take the largest. Now, this method, so this is quadratic. I'm not sure whether this one can be made to run in n log n, but similar problems can be optimized. But let's not do this because uh, um, dynamic programming is tricky enough. Uh, we will do uh, this in the... Um, later on. We will cover a lot of dynamic programming uh, uh, problems. Okay, so now, um, are you with me? Did you understand? Yes? Yes, yes. Yeah, you exhaustively search through all compatible uh, activities Take one will the largest duration. Oh, so you start from the left. So you start from left and go to the right. Yes. So you start with the first activity. Optimal solution with only one activity is just that activity. <laughs> right? Now, um, say second activity, if it does not in, uh, overlap with the first activity, Optimal solution will be, of course, that activity plus the first activity, right? Because it's non-conflicting, optimal solution for it is just itself, and so forth. So you go from left to right, right? Always looking at non-conflicting activities with respect to the last activity, pick their optimal solutions, uh, pick the uh, longest one, in duration and extend it with the height activity. Now, this, now you got a whole bunch of solutions, right, that sit in a table. But 
t at the very end, t of n, is not necessarily the solution of the problem uh, that we are looking because t n, uh, the solution to the final, the longest uh, uh, sub-problem is activity that has to end with end activity and you are not guaranteed that the optimal solution has to end with end activity. So what you do is once you fill the table, you simply in linear time scan the table looking for the largest TK. Yeah? Yes. So the, okay, let us uh, uh, write uh, the, say we start, uh, uh, so T of uh, one will be just activity, ah, okay, let's call it tau of one is uh, uh, T of uh, one and uh, uh, what is this? T of one is let me not complicate it. So uh, T of one is just uh, F one minus S one. So now, what is T of two in this example, if this is activity two, right? Well, what do we, we insist that uh, the solution to the problem <coughs> for initial segment one, two, has to contain this activity, right? So this means that the recursion will overrule this one. It cannot be used because it overlaps. So T of two will be also just uh, F uh, uh, two minus S two, right? Let's see what is T of three. Say T of three is this. Right? Uh, this is the sequence one, two, third activity. What does the recipe say? Uh, look for all <coughs> activities that do not overlap with it. Uh, right? Which is the activity? Well, you simply check the end time, compare it with the starting time. Obviously, this is activity one. So T of three will be T of one plus F3 minus S3. Uh, what will be T of 4? Um, T of 4, and now that's an interesting situation, you see. T of 4, the non-conflicting activities are 2 and 1. So which one do we pick to extend? We look up what is T of 1, it's this, and compare it with T of two. It's this, whichever is larger, right, depending how long the intervals are, whichever is larger, you pick that one, say it's activity two, and you extend it with four. And you keep doing that, activity five, you have to throw away four, but now you have three possible activities. Uh, it's activity two, activity one, and activity three. Well, clearly, optimal uh, solution for one is out of picture because it is worse than optimal solution for three. So it will be either one, three, or just two, extended by five, depending whether this plus this is larger or smaller than that. Uh, Okay, and you keep doing that until you reach the end. Now, the last solution is optimal solution among all intervals, but it insists that it has to contain the last interval, right? And maybe the globally optimal solution doesn't involve the last interval. So then you look at your table simply you have here your table, and you have T1, T2, T3, all the way up to Tn, and you simply scan it and pick the largest one. Now, my claim is that this is truly 
the optimal solution. What would be uh, the reason that the, it might fail? Well, because we picked optimal solution that uh, uh, we insist always that the optimal solution must end with the last element. Why is this not restrictive? What do you think? Yeah, but so why, so as we proceeded with the construction, we didn't look for optimal solutions among first i intervals. If we did only that, then this will be in fact uh, uh, optimal solution. But here we insist we restrict optimal solutions only among those that contain the end element. You see, the reason is, you simply say, consider the optimal solution. It has to end with some element j. Well, it will be constructed when we were solving the problem for all activities that end with the j activity. Because every solution has to end with something. But then optimal solution among those that end with that solution, with that activity, of course, uh, is, was constructed when we considered the subproblem J. So um, uh, please, this is, uh, I, in my experience for te teaching algorithms for, I don't know how many, more than 15 years. Um, you know, people really find dynamic programming tricky, and it's extremely important uh, technique, especially for people that want to compete on ACM programming competitions. Usually the tougher, toughest problem boils down to some tricky dynamic programming. Uh, so please read the notes and read the textbook. Yes? So to summarize, you find an optimal solution for every single element, for any element. Yes. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, 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 that's a million dollar question. I'll tell you how. You try to solve it with greedy. And if you fail, uh, then you use a bigger hammer. Unfortunately, there is no taxonomy, there is no recipe that says this is uh, uh, solvable by greedy. This is solvable by dynamic programming. Even though people try to uh, describe what's solvable by greedy by this theory of matroids, right? But it's just no good. So the thing is this. Uh, this is where, why computer science is a lot of, it's a skill, it's a craft. If you solve uh, 50 dynamic programming problems and 50 greedy problems, you are almost guaranteed, uh, if the problem is not too hard, <laughs> that you will know what to use. Uh, but uh, the only thing is uh, just, uh, I, I'll be really frank with you, it's just the gut feeling. Uh, you try, and this is where the proof of validity comes, of correctness come in play, is in place. Because it's so tempting here to do all sorts of clever, greedy things, but for all of them, uh, you have a counterexample. So the only way to master dynamic programming is by solving huge number, I mean, not huge, but a sizable number of problems. Uh, and your textbooks, both textbooks, uh, have quite a few, and we will be doing, uh, I'm sure we will be doing at least 20 problems uh, in the class. Uh, yes? Are you saying that the assumption solution has to end with the last one? No, no. This is why after, you see, here, the optimal solution for Tn ends with n, but this might not be the largest T in the table. So after you fill the table, you have to scan it to find the largest, and that's your optimal solution. Yep.
OK. You see, if you didn't, uh, uh, if you didn't constrain the problem by saying you have to end with i solution, you only know that the largest possible among uh, i solutions, you don't know which, what is the end point, which, should, uh, which one you should, should. It's not absolutely necessary, but it's a good practice to uh, always find a nice constraint that is not restrictive, that doesn't cause you to miss the optimal solution. Here is another uh, nice uh, and relatively simple but very useful example. Okay, let's see. So, um, let's see. Maybe I'm smarter with the with the hat. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, my goodness, I hope this guy didn't have fleas. Um, so, uh, okay, guys. So, 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 okay. So you have a sequence of numbers. Uh, say uh, one, uh, seven, uh, 19, two, five, and then 13, and then 21, and then three, and so forth. Uh, N of them, right? Here is your N number. Your task is to find the longest subsequence of all these, or from this sequence, that consists, that is increasing. So let's see what would be here increasing. Probably this is a good thing to take, and maybe this one, but you cannot take 19. If you take 5, uh, is it good to take five? Five, five, two, five, two, one. That would be the best, right? Okay, here it was. But imagine you have a gigantic, uh, you know, a sequence that consists of a million numbers. And you want to pick the longest increasing sequence, subsequence. Let us now think. What do you think? What will be? The sub problems here. So here the sub problems will be for every i, we solve the following problem. Find the longest a subsequence among first i elements only, but uh, which is of maximum length, which is increasing, and which ends with a i. So again, we insist uh, we don't want to find just the longest one out of first i many, but we insist that it must end with i. Why do you think this is a good idea? If I insist that my sequence has to end with i, what shall I look? What are the numbers uh, whose optimal solution is extendable by i? Numbers, more than numbers larger than i number. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> I am an autopilot. Uh, um, it is uh, all the numbers, of course, smaller than I. Uh, why? Because if a number is smaller than I, uh, you see where the, how we use the extra constraint. All what I have to do is just look at all numbers smaller than this one. And among all of these numbers, you find the longest subsequence for them, and you extend it with the ith number. Right? And again, you put your solution 
in a table. Now, what do you think? Is it necessary to write here, say for i, it's to write the whole optimal subsequence? Uh, well, let's now at the moment do that. So it, at i cell, we write optimal subsequence with, uh, that ends with i. Then we scan and find the longest one, right? Say it's the Kate, and voila, that will be your optimal solution. Right? So once again, you truncate your sequence up to the i. Then you look. Uh, optimal, if you, optimal sequence for this can be obtained from previously constructed optimal sequences only by those that end in a number smaller than this number. So if I'm at the cell i, right, I will first look for all numbers, so it will be a quadratic algorithm, I will look for all numbers in the sequence that are smaller than i, look up how long is the optimal solution for them, pick the longest and extend it with i. Clearly, we don't need to write the whole sequence. We just have to put a pointer which sequence we are extending. And then once we find the optimal, we can uh, backtrack to find the sequence itself, right? So uh, now here is a challenge for you. Uh, this is obviously a quadratic algorithm because the table is of size n. And for every entry, you have to scan all previous uh, uh, numbers to see first which are the smallest, and then you have to find the optimal solutions in the table and pick the largest. So it's quadratic. It is possible to do it in time n log n, but it is really tricky. But uh, it's an extremely useful trick for, in fact, we will do uh, an example of dynamic programming that uses the same trick. Uh, it's one of my favorite uh, called uh, turtle stack problem, right? Okay, so, um, so are you with me? Notice again, insisting that, why is not res restrictive here that we require that the height uh, uh, sequence optimal solution has to end with i. Well, you simply say, look at the optimal solution, global, without any restrictions, just uh, its increasing and largest length. It has to end with an element. Well, that sequence will be constructed when we were constructing optimal sequence that ends with that particular element. So, so you see, it's a kind of simultaneously making your life both more complicated by solving a whole bunch of problems rather than the, uh, the problem at hand. So you generalize the problem, but then you also restrict it with extra condition to allow simple recursion. And this balance, how to generalize and how to restrict is a crucial uh, kind of uh, skill that you pick up by uh, solving problems and going together with me uh, through solutions of uh, problems uh, here in class. We will do a whole bunch of dynamic programming problems. Okay. So making change. Uh, you remember we had our greedy algorithm that made change by always returning largest possible, excuse me, denomination coin. But in general, we also showed there are examples where greedy fails, right? We came up with this simple example that had only like, what was it, three or four uh, denominations, and we found a bit kind of odd values that were greedy does not produce optimal solution. This algorithm produces optimal solution for any amount and for any denominations which include the lowest unit, one, so that you can give change for any amount to be guaranteed that uh, 
it's possible to come up with any amount, right? So the first value, V1, is 1, and uh, you have, say, n coins, and they can be really strange values, right? You want to come up with an algorithm that does the same, namely that uses as few coins as possible to give uh, 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 back the amount uh, that you are asked to, right? Now, uh, this solution that I'm going to show you, if I, uh, if you are kind of, well, let me first tell you the solution and then you will tell me what's the drawback of the solution. How do we solve this problem? And this is a big, big kind of heavy duty trick. The idea is, uh, what will be sub-problems? Restricting subsets of the coins doesn't look promising. You solve huge number of sub-problems, namely, if you have to give amount C, you solve for every I between 1 and C, uh, what is the optimal selection of coins to give that amount, right? So if you have to give, uh, say, amount of $100, you will solve, uh, you will find the optimal solutions for all amounts between $1 and $100. How do we do that? Assume, for example, at the moment, that we solve the uh, this problem for all j uh, smaller than i. So for every smaller amount, we know what is the optimal solution. How would you cook up a solution, optimal solution for the amount i? Yes? Sorry, say. You scan all uh, previous solutions and you see what you can add, but um, that would be a way of doing it, but it would be very inefficient because these, there are lots of solutions, probably much more, the amount is much larger than the number of coins. How about we do search by coins? Yes. Uh, uh, you see, unfortunately, it's not additive. If, as you see, if you find optimal solution for 50, it, doubling it might not produce optimal solution for 100. Now, yes? Yes. Uh, well, 99 cents, then you would add one coin, but maybe there is a better way to say do 97 cents, and uh, uh, which uses fewer coins, and you add a three, coi three cent coin. But you are on the right, yes? Ah, that's the solution. So you simply say the following. Say the values of the coins are V1 up to Vn. You look at the amount I minus V1, how many coins you need, then I minus V2, V2 how many coins, I minus V3, all the way up to I minus Vn. You choose the smallest one and you just add this extra coin. Right? Now, let me ask you something. Why do that? Why not say the following? Uh, well, uh, consider, why not say, let's see what, uh, instead of uh, saying, uh, why check all, say take out any value, say v Vm, you take one value Vm, you look at the minimal number of coins you need, uh, and then you just add one coin, 
Why do you have to go through all of the, yes? That's one, the, you see the thing is also which coin, how do you know, that, or one can argue like this, take the optimal solution, pick any coin and remove it. What is left must be an optimal solution for the leftover, right? Uh, so you just add one coin and you're there, but you don't know which coin to take out. Because what, maybe optimal solution uses only Vn and Vn minus one. So you have to scan through all possible choices, uh, pick the optimal solution, and then add one. Now what do you think, is this really uh, of the same efficiency algorithm as we had seen so far? Or am I cheating you a bit? Uh, so the table is of what size? The table is of size C. What is the runtime of this algorithm? It's O of C. But is this polynomial in the size of the instance? How many bits do you need to write C? how many, regardless of how big it is, the number of bits is log C. So you see, the size of the problem is uh, n values of coins, n integers, plus log C. But the solution is n times C, and that's not polynomial. So this is an exponential time algorithm. But guess what? Unfortunately, you cannot do better. And this is a case when, so it's kind of what is called parameterized complexity. So uh, uh, algorithm is polynomial in number of denominations, but it is not polynomial in the amount. Because the amount can be written with only log many digits and the length of recursion is exponential in the number of digits, right? Because if I tell you, say, uh, that uh, the amount is, uh, say, 1,024, and the coins are, say, 1, 5, 7, and 12. What is the size of the problem? Well, it's essentially 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, plus the commas. It's 10, say, uh, the length of the input. If you write it, uh, you know, representation in, uh, on the input will be very small, say, less than 10 in, if it's in decimal. But the length of the solution is 1,024 times 1, 2, 3, 4. Right, so it's huge compared to the uh, encoding of the problem. But sometimes, you know, there is no free lunch and sometimes the devil wins. Uh, and this is an example of something that we don't believe there is a feasible solution. Okay, so we continue DP uh, next um, Wednesday. So please read the notes. There will be lots of pretty tough problems.